Welcome to Clinical Minute. Dr. Barbara Lacey is the medical director of a 12-provider primary care practice. Her office is located in an urban setting and serves individuals from the surrounding low-income communities as well as students from nearby colleges. She recently attended a Grand Rounds session on long-acting reversible contraception and is eager to begin offering IUD services for the first time at this practice. Six of the other clinicians in Dr. Lacey's practice are interested in providing IUD insertions to their patients as well. Like Dr. Lacey, none of these providers has actually inserted an IUD since they were students. To prepare the practice to begin offering IUD services, there are four steps that Dr. Lacey must take. Provide training to clinicians and support staff. Develop clinic policies. Address administrative issues. And coordinate inventory and equipment issues. The first step in integrating IUD services is to make sure the staff is well trained. IUD training for clinicians and support staff should cover the IUD options currently available on the market, scientific evidence that dispels commonly held myths about IUDs, determining appropriate candidates for an IUD, techniques for insertion and removal, resources for patient education, ensuring informed consent, and the process for patient follow-up. Three IUDs are currently available in the United States. Paragard is a copper-containing IUD that is approved for 10 years of use. Mirena and Skyla are levonorgestrel intrauterine devices and are sometimes also called an intrauterine system, or IUS. Mirena releases a higher dose of hormone and is approved for 5 years of use. Skyla releases a slightly lower dose and is approved for three years of use. Addressing common myths on IUDs and ensuring that clinical staff are clear on the science is one of the most important aspects of training. Healthcare professionals commonly hold inaccurate beliefs on IUDs, especially when it comes to mechanism of action, the safety and appropriateness of use in young nulliparous women, and risk of infection. The following are true statements about IUDs that can help dispel common myths. A large body of evidence has shown that the primary mechanism by which IUDs prevent pregnancy is the creation of a hostile environment for sperm, which prevents fertilization. Women who have had ectopic pregnancies in the past are candidates for IUDs. In addition, IUDs do not increase the risk of ectopic pregnancies. An IUD can be used safely in an adolescent or woman who has not had a child. IUDs do not increase a woman's risk of infertility. The risk of infection after IUD insertion is low. In the 21 days post-insertion, the risk of infection is less than 1%. After three weeks, the risk of infection is no greater than that for the general population using no contraception. A second key component of provider training is proficiency with patient selection. Providers need to consider both the medical eligibility criteria and the clinical scenario when deciding if a woman is a candidate for IUD use. The CDC's United States Medical Eligibility Criteria for Contraceptive Use is a helpful resource for healthcare providers. All women should be counseled about the range of contraceptive options for which they are medically eligible and allowed to make an informed decision. Traditionally, many adolescents and nulliparous women have not been offered the option of an IUD during contraceptive counseling, despite their eligibility for this method. In determining patient eligibility, health care providers must also consider clinical factors, including possible pregnancy and sexually transmitted infections. IUDs can be inserted in most women after pregnancy has been reasonably ruled out. The copper IUD can be utilized as emergency contraception. It can be inserted to prevent a pregnancy for up to five days after sex. As emergency contraception, the copper IUD is more effective than emergency contraceptive pills, 
because it reduces the risk of getting pregnant by more than 99%. Screening for STIs is not required prior to insertion. That said, women at risk for STIs should be tested. It is not necessary to delay the insertion of the IUD to wait for STI screening results. If the patient tests positive for an STI, she can be treated with the IUD in place. IUDs should not be placed in a patient if there is a current uterine infection or pelvic inflammatory disease. Women who have an abnormality that distorts the shape of the uterus should not use an IUD. For a patient who has recently had a baby, an IUD can be inserted within 48 hours of delivery in the obstetrical care setting. After the 48-hour window, the patient should wait four weeks or more to have an IUD inserted postpartum. IUDs can also be inserted up to seven days following a first trimester abortion, provided there is no infection. IUDs can be inserted at any time in the menstrual cycle, as long as the woman is not pregnant. Backup contraception is never needed after insertion of a copper T IUD. In cases where Mirena or Skyla is inserted within five days of menses, immediately postpartum or postabortion, or directly preceding use of another hormonal method, backup contraception is not necessary. In all other cases with a levonorgestrel intrauterine system, backup contraception should be used for seven days after insertion. Providers will require training in IUD insertion and removal techniques. Insertion training begins with teaching providers infection control measures, including how to load the IUD into the inserter without contaminating the product, and the importance of applying antiseptic to the cervix and vagina before insertion. Insertion training should also cover sounding the uterus, using a tenaculum to stabilize the cervix, placing the IUD, trimming the strings, and assessing the patient for cramping or dizziness. Comprehensive IUD removal training includes explaining infection control measures and demonstrating techniques to visualize and grasp the strings to remove the device. Educating patients about their contraceptive choices and obtaining informed consent are important elements of providing IUD services. One resource providers can use for patient education is ARHP's online tool, Method Match. Method Match details every available contraceptive option and allows a user to sort and filter methods based on the criteria that are important to her. For women interested in an IUD, providers can offer high-quality patient education materials and reinforce the two key counseling messages that are IUDs provide long-term, highly effective, reversible contraceptive protection and IUDs are safe and appropriate for use by most women. Visit www.arhp.org slash patient for a comprehensive collection of evidence-based educational resources designed for patients, including Method Match. Providers should be sure to counsel patients that changes in menstruation are common with an IUD. The copper IUD is often associated with heavier bleeding that lessens over time and the hormone-releasing IUD is generally associated with irregular bleeding and lighter menstrual flow. Providers need to emphasize that IUDs do not protect against STIs and advise women at risk to also use condoms for STI prevention. A good strategy for dispelling myths is to ask patients what they know about IUDs and then address any misinformation that is mentioned. Risks of IUD use, like perforation or expulsion, must be described and explained in perspective for patients. Explain that complications are rare. For example, while perforation is a known risk of IUD use, it only occurs in approximately one of every 1,000 insertions. Comprehensive counseling for IUDs includes ensuring that patients understand the timing and the process of insertion, the requirements for backup contraception, the IUD's duration of use, how and why to check the strings, and the importance of pre-insertion medication with a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug such as ibuprofen. Providers should instruct patients to return or seek medical attention for any symptoms of infection, expulsion, or pregnancy.
The final topic in IUD services training is patient follow-up. Patients should return three to six weeks after IUD insertion for a follow-up exam. At this visit, the provider should assess the woman's satisfaction with the IUD, screen for menstrual changes or other side effects, and ask about condom use for STI prevention, as needed. At this visit, the provider will also perform a pelvic exam to check for the presence of the IUD strings and for any signs of infection. In addition to staff training, Dr. Lacey will also need to develop clinic policies on IUD services for her primary care practice. These policies should clearly describe the practice protocols for how staff will manage the various aspects of providing IUD services, including patient selection, pregnancy testing, STI screening and treatment, backup contraception, insertion timing for patients who've had recent unprotected sex, same-day insertion, pre-medication, the referral process for staff providers who do not insert IUDs, and the referral process for immediate postpartum insertion. Dr. Lacey should also ensure that the policies are consistent with the training materials provided to clinicians and other staff. The third step Dr. Lacey should take is to address the administrative issues associated with IUD services. These include billing and coding issues, scheduling policies, and informing patients about cost and insurance requirements. Dr. Lacey should ensure that the administrative staff have access to the correct billing codes and are aware of the need to code separately for the device and IUD-related services, such as insertion and removal. She should review the scheduling policies to ensure that the front desk staff provide patients with information that is consistent with office practices. Working with the office manager, Dr. Lacey should gather information about cost of the devices and insurance requirements like billing and copays. She should also determine pricing for self-pay patients and possibly consider including a sliding scale system. It would be worthwhile to research the various financial assistance programs available for IUDs and make the staff aware of those resources. Finally, Dr. Lacey needs to address ordering and stocking of the devices and ensuring the availability of the necessary ancillary equipment. By creating a checklist of required equipment and supplies and assigning specific staff members with the responsibility of keeping them in stock, Dr. Lacey can ensure that the practice will be prepared to perform insertions. She should work with the office manager to determine a process for stocking IUDs. Because IUDs can be expensive, some practices order devices on a one-off basis once a patient schedules an insertion appointment. If a clinic is able to keep several devices in stock, it allows them to offer patients much more flexibility and convenience. Dr. Lacey organized an in-service training on IUD patient selection, insertion, and management for the clinical staff. Dr. Lacey created a set of draft policies and protocols for IUD services and allowed her colleagues to provide feedback. She worked with the office manager to address administrative issues and to ensure that support staff was familiar with the relevant policies and procedures and prepared to manage the ordering and stocking of devices and needed equipment. Within four months, the practice began offering IUD services to patients. In the first six months, the providers inserted 50 IUDs. Considering the effectiveness rate of user-dependent hormonal contraceptives with typical use, Dr. Lacey estimated that her practice prevented eight unintended pregnancies in just their first six months of offering IUD services.